Julie and I'm a teacher here at UCC Language Centre and, and I'm going to talk to you about um, some research that I did on my MA as well and it's based around the statement they won't talk and it's um, really aiming to um, look at creating inclusive ethos institutionally um, in all um, educational places. So um, to start with the inspiration um, from this um, research really stems from a three-year teaching experience that I had in Beijing and it was throughout the um, three-year teaching experience I started to really um, kind of reflect on how I thought of um, students who identify themselves as Chinese and I started to question how maybe um, back home back in London in the different institutions I worked in that they, maybe they would be misunderstood and very much misrepresented um, so I really started to reflect on um, on the issue that they won't talk um, and this led to um, the aim of my project my dissertation project because I wanted to kind of investigate the issue and to look at the root of the problem and see okay a lot of um, teachers back home and, and me previously I went to Beijing had quite a lot of frustrations if I had large numbers of Chinese students that they wouldn't talk in the classroom and when I started to have um, more contact with higher education teachers they were also saying why won't they talk they won't talk and I thought okay I want to investigate what this issue actually is and I wanted to investigate the root of it so I wanted to um, investigate the perceptions of Chinese students engagement and active participation in the classroom and I interviewed um, students who identified themselves as Chinese as well as lecturers surrounding the topic of talking in the classroom um, so I started with looking at the statement they won't talk um, and it was something that I heard as I said in, and I would engage in this kind of discourse before I went to Beijing and before doing my MA and I, and I kept thinking to myself I keep hearing this statement they won't talk they won't they're like this and um, they were very seen as problematic and I kept thinking to myself it doesn't it's not moved forward over the years that I've been teaching this statement is still circling um, and I know that many teachers and including myself we try so much to, to you know get students to interact and get students to talk so there must be another way to maybe look at this um, so in the evidence the first bit that really stood out for me oh sorry 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 context I've jumped forward there um, so the context of where this um, research really fits in is for me engagement and active participation for a student to be able to um, really engage and active and actively participate in their learning they really need to feel a sense of belonging and for them to really feel that sense of belonging the institution really needs to adopt and ensure that there is inclusive ethos surrounding all learners um, so what does that mean inclusive ethos um, for me the, the, the key aspect of this per first part of the project is the type of discourse that surrounds certain groups of learners and in this case it's Chinese learners so the first area in the interviews that really stood out was the self-belief that the students were coming into this new community with quite complex challenges and had quite um, a lot of issues with their self-belief um, so one student felt that if others in the classroom and their teachers understood their cultural attributes more then they could be tolerated and I thought the word tolerated uh, was quite a negative word and they perceived themselves quite negatively another student felt that his variety of English was actually useless so seeing that, that his variety of English was very much useless again was quite a negative deficit view of self and then another student saying that because he was educated in China he felt a loser compared to other students who had um, and, and, and often referred to European students and seeing them in some ways as a bit more superior as well and, and it really came across a little bit of division of kind of them and us and feeling very much very different but the main problem really was so these students are coming into this new community with very much complex challenges and then the institution had this discourse surrounding this group of learners that they're passive learners so what we're seeing is very much a deficit view of self plus oh they're passive learners they're uncritical learners 
or their education. Oh, it's all about copying. It's just memorization. It's just regurgitation. And what it really does actually, the, especially the education, it really masks the individual diverse education experience they may have. Because in the interview, six of the students, only one of them was actually educated in mainland China. The rest, had one had been educated for 10 years in Brussels, um, and one had done A-levels um, in a British system in Hong Kong. But so these kind of statements, their education, you're really masking that kind of individual diverse experience. And on top of that, any kind of statements where you're referring to a group of people as they is really an essentialist type way of thinking where you're grouping them all together and you're really masking that individual diverse um, personality. And it's, it's known as essentialism, which is really ultimately stereotyping and can lead to quite prejudiced views. And then also seeing their education system as copying and memorization, whereas here we're very critical, is quite an ethnocentric view. In, a, in many ways, it's making out that the education, the context that you're in, is superior to where they're coming from. Um, and this is known as the reduced other view. So we've got students coming in with a deficit view of themselves, and some of the discourse that can surround certain groups of students is seeing them actually as a reduced other as well, which puts up huge barriers and, it, and can create quite a, a, a lack of sense of belonging for them. Um, this is something I've just added in because I now have started to introduce this in my classroom, and especially in the first um, week of knowing students. This is a TED talk that really highlights the danger of a single story. Um, and it's fantastic because it really um, tackles the, um, uh, the concepts of essentialism and ethnocentric views. And it, the, it's by Chamanda, and she gives very simple examples of how we have simple, single stories for whole groups of people and how damaging that single story can be. Um, and so I now, in the first week of my classes, introduce the terms essentialism and ethnocentric views um, with students and get them to discuss their single stories about certain countries that they have and, and to allow them to discuss that. And it really is um, criticising the kind of um, essentialist views that we, we normalise so often about certain groups and nas national groups. So this led to the self-reflection um, aspect and I just want you to sit for just, just a few seconds to think about how can you or do you adopt an inclusive ethos in your context to avoid essentialist and ethnocentric views. So if you just sit there in silence just for 20 seconds or so. Now, just moving on to the second part of um, the research was the direct comments about um, talking in the classroom. One student felt that she understood the teaching style that, of getting students to talk, but that she herself did prefer to be a more, more of a listener, and that's how she preferred um, uh, learning. And throughout the interview, she kept saying, I know I'm weird, I'm a weirdo because I don't talk in the classroom. And I thought, that's, that, that's a real exclusive environment that they're in if they feel that they're weird because they're not conforming to talking in the classroom. Um, this student here felt that she wouldn't be remembered because she wasn't like other European students who did talk in the classroom. So again, starting to see that divide between them and us um, as well. So that, that, those comments really resonated with me and I started to consider that when we talk about active participation and the lecturers in the interviews, active participation was immediately connected with talking. And I thought that 
active listening is such an active and crucial um, learning skill that maybe we needed to value that in the term active participation. And then that also led me on to start thinking about how I looked at silence in the classroom and how I valued silence. So then I started to reflect on actually when I was in Beijing, I was the one that getting frustrated because I wasn't getting anything back. And it was my frustrations. The students were happily learning, happily developing, and would gradually talk when they were ready to talk. So I started questioning being quite a talkative, impulsive um, person, that it's maybe my fear and my tolerance of silence. I started to think as well that they have a right to be silent. If a person's not ready to talk or for whatever reason, they have a right to be silent as well. And I think we can definitely underestimate the time um, for people that people need to process information. My our, um, head of department back in London actually um, called her, would see herself as an in introverted learner and she found it very difficult in meetings, and this is in her own language, her first language, she found it very difficult in meetings to have an opinion because everybody just jumped in so quickly and there was no time given or space where she needed that little bit more time. So if we're thinking of learners that have got an additional um, complex challenge of the language, it's really how much time are we giving for them to process that information? Um, if we want students to come up with ideas, are we allowing space for them to actually come up with ideas? And also, I think many of us may know that when you join a new community, whether it's a work community or whatever that community is, that it really takes time to be able to voice your opinions, you've got to feel like an illegitimate member. You've got to feel like you're an equal to feel that confidence to start giving your opinion. Um, so it may take students that time to feel like they are a legitimate member if they do ever get to that stage. And silence, I think, is a real big part of a person's identity. Two of my students I asked um, um, the other um, week about silence and for one of them they it, they feared it they know that they were always kept busy they didn't want their mind to kind of um, think about silence because they would think about things they didn't want to and the other student said it was her complete comfort zone and it's where she felt most comfortable and they sat next to each other in the classroom so it's quite interesting to hear what silence actually means to each person as well when they are in the community of a classroom so this really led on to the last um, self-reflection um, aspect, and that's really about using <coughs> silence and maybe revaluing silence in the classroom as a very effective learning tool. So I just again like you to, for 20 seconds or so, just to reflect on this last quote. And then just to finish off, highlighting the problems surrounding terms like they are passive learners when we're talking about groups of um, different learners or they won't talk, the problems in those kind of statements and thinking about how we can actually adopt um, an, inclusive di an inclusive discourse that does avoid those essentialist and ethnic-centric views that are so, such a normalised part of talking about different national groups and to also look at how maybe we can rebalance and, and revalue um, silence in learning so that those that maybe do prefer to learn in silence or are more listeners that so they feel that the way they learn is equally valued to those who are maybe more talkative in the classroom. Thank you.